day here in the UK, it's a little bit uh, rainy, it's a little bit drizzly, but I suppose that's uh, the time of the year for that. I hope the rains have been well and that things have been proceeding well in Zimbabwe. Well as to be expected, I suppose. I hope I find you well in body, spirit and mind. Today I'm just having a little talk with yourselves, a conversation. Because things are happening and we cannot stay silent while things are happening. What brings me to the fore today are the matters regarding Ngava Zinduna Mountain, an issue that has spoken about for so many times, a matter I've touched on on many occasions. Ngava Zinduna Mountain is a sacred mountain. It is a sacred mountain for the Ndebele Nation. Zimbabwe is a nation of nations. People need to understand that. We are a nation of nations. There are 15 or so nations in the modern state of Zimbabwe today. Peoples who have a culture, a heritage, a language, customs, practices and norms, who have cuisine, who have codes of dress, who have architecture, who have music, who have dance, who have poetry. We are a nation of nations. And that being so, then it gives a responsibility to the government of the day to recognize that, to understand that, to follow that through in practice, not just in words, but in deeds. We return back to the issue of Ndawa Zinduna Mountain, a sacred mountain, a mountain which yet again is being transgressed upon by people from the government. It is with regret that we find ourselves in a position whereby we as African people are having to defend ourselves against an African government with respect to protecting our customs, protecting our traditions, protecting our languages, our norms. When that very government continually says it fought the war of liberation, for Africans, for Zimbabweans. Right now that is not true. We take a look at what's happening in Chiredzi amongst the, the Shanghai nation. Their sacred land is about to be forcefully taken over. Their ancestral land are about to be forcefully taken over by a government that continuously bangs on about being a revolutionary government, a government that went to war. Went to war for who? Who did they fight for? We have to ask that question. Who did this government fight for? Because wherever you look in Zimbabwe, they are stoking up tribal tensions. They are bringing up tribalism. Whether you look at Ntawa Zinduna Mountain, or Chiredzi, or Victoria Falls, or, or Wanki, or Ndari, or Chikutu, wherever you look, this government is stoking up tribalism, is feeding tribalism, is making sure that 
we spend all the time that we have looking at each other so that we don't look at what the government is doing or what the government should be doing. Gawazanduna Mountain is sacred. There are, other, there are three other localities where they had sacred mountains or, sh or sacred shrines and those people were allowed to control those areas. But when it comes to Ngawazanduna Mountain, suddenly we are not allowed to control our sacred mountain. That is tribalism in practice. That is what tribalism looks like when you come across such things. The Vice President Chiwenga is well read on Debele history. He knows a great deal about it. We have talked about it when we've met. So I know 100% he knows the value of Ndawa Zinduna Mountain. The President Nanakwa, he is also well versed in Debele history, customs, practices and norms. So he too knows the importance and the value of Ndawa Zinduna Mountain. And yet, and yet, we are forced to witness the nonsense, utter nonsense, that has been happening of late on Dawes and Duna Mount. For myself, as the chief of that area, I have to speak up. I cannot keep quiet when such things are happening in the face of my eyes. Otherwise, the other traditional leaders will say, Chief Nsanche, I'm going what happens to our mountain? I must be able to give them a reply of what happened to the mountain. But the majority of what is happening to that mountain does not come from a young man just walking in the street does not come from that young man called Floyd Ambrose. Ah. It is coming from the president's office. Because the vice president and the president know full well about the value and the importance of Ndawa Zinduna Mountain. And if they believed that, they, they would have stopped this man Floyd Ambrose long time ago. But the fact that he continues means that he has obtained sanction and authority from the Vice President and the President of the Republic of Zimbabwe to do what he's doing on Dawa Zindula Mountain. Because they are well versed in the history of the Ndebele Nation. And they know that what they are doing right now is contrary to that history is contrary to that heritage. In the face of such conduct, we have no option but to seek international protection for that mountain. And so it's been for some time now that we've been looking at how we can encapsulate it, put it into a World Heritage Site. There are various criteria to that. I think we meet most of those criteria. If we don't meet some of those criteria, then we can always add an attachment to Motopos, or an attachment to Kameroon, or an attachment to other localities. And indeed, we can work very closely with the city of kings and queens, Blawai, who has many sites that qualify to be classed as World Heritage Sites. And Dawa Zinduna Mountain could be but one of those sites as part of a package. And so really in the fullness of time, we will achieve international protection for Dawa Zinduna Mountain. 
we will have a one kilometer radius around that mountain where no one can build anything, no one can live there, no one can do anything, just like in other places around the world. If you go to the big rock in Australia in the center there, that's been circled off a long time ago and is pr protected and looked after. We will do likewise with the Dawes and Dula Mountain. Yes, I'm aware that Mkuza Rural District Council has placed a number of people close to that mountain. But Mkuza Rural District Council was informed by myself many years ago that we would be going for international protection for that mountain. So if any of those people need to be recompensed in any way, they should look to Mkuza Rural District Council who did something which they knew very well would never work in the fullness of time. So we're not being harsh to those people, we're just simply pointing them in the right direction. That in our quest to protect Ndawazaduna Mountain, people will have to be evacuated to give us a one kilometer radius around that mountain. So that never again Never again should a people, should a nation within the political Zimbabwe have to defend what is theirs against a government that will not see reason. A government that is so consumed by corruption, it refuses to see reason. We hope that our journey will give people hope and that indeed we will share it with other nations within Zimbabwe of how too they can protect their particular areas so that peace can be there. If you look at the African Union Charter on Human Rights and People's Rights, it says people's rights because it recognizes that as a group of people, as a nation, you will have wishes, you will have aspirations, you will have things to which you hold value to, things to which you would like protection given to those things. The last thing you want is to be faced by your own government your own government desecrating your sacred place. A most regrettable chapter in our history that a government that says it is full of war veterans and it fought for this country refuses to protect people's rights. Those rights to which it says we fought for, it refuses to protect them. And so we've taken it upon ourselves to engage in this international practice, in this international consultation. And we will do so. We will do so in the full glare of the light. We will do so even if the patriotic law has been passed. We will continue to do so. Because under what has happened in or on Dabazanduna Mountain, I would like to be the first person to prosecute those responsible under that law to prosecute those responsible under that law. And if it means it finally ends at the doorstep of the President's office, then so be it, the President must be prosecuted under the patriotic law. So let that law come. We have a lot of work to do with it. We have a lot of protection to do with it. We have a lot of prosecuting to do with it. Let it come. 
But as for Ntabas and Duna Mountain, we will get our international protection. The young man floored Ambrose. It is clear he obtained sanction and authority from the President's office. We are asking that he be at least arrested to answer the charges that he is committed on that mountain. We will give the prosecuting authorities a little time to arrest, detain and prosecute him. But failing that, failing that, we on ourselves, by ourselves, will be launching private criminal prosecutions against him. Amongst those charges, we will be citing him for are three counts of contempt of High Court orders, where on those three occasions he has just willfully ignored determinations produced by the High Court of Zimbabwe. We will be charging him with breaking and entering into the said properties on Dawazinduna Mountain. We will be charging him with malicious damage. Four counts to those properties that he damaged whilst on the hill. We will be charging him with verbal and physical abuse of the people there. Because that is what happened. We will be charging him with assault and battery on that mountain also. Because that is what has also happened. We will be charging him with being in possession of a weapon. That is what happened there also. We will be charging him with discharging a weapon in a public place. That is what happened. We will be charging him with attempted murder. Because also that is what has happened. These are serious matters. In all the statements that we are making, we are adhering to the law of the land. To say the rule of law must apply. Just because you are a member of a political party should not give you authority to be a hoodlum, to be a vandal, to operate outside the law. But if there are no prosecutions coming from the President's office, then we will know very well indeed that it was the President and the Vice President who sent Floyd Ambrose to Dawazinduna Hill, Dawazinduna Mountain, to effect what he did. It will be clear to everyone that this young man was sent by the highest office in the land to go and desecrate a sacred mountain to the Ndebele nation. Sent by a president and a vice president who know very well indeed how important that mountain is. And yet they chose to stoke up tribal tensions. They chose to bring up tribalism. They chose to bring chaos to the country so that the country doesn't look at them and ask them why they're not doing certain things, why they're not facilitating certain things. This private criminal prosecution will be done in the glare of the light. It will be done in the glare of the international arena. Every bit of paper that we put together will be published in the international arena. Every silence that comes from any department will be published in the international arena. Every part of this case 
will be thrown up in the international arena. So that the world at large can see what is the definition of political corruption. We are trying to craft that definition for them, so that when they look at Zimbabwe, they will have a definition for political corruption. And it would have been exposed by the young man, Floyd Ambrose. Having been sent by the President and the Vice President. The idea that Floyd could have done this on his own, we reject totally. Because his brazen acts tell us that yes, he had full authority. But more than that, what has happened up until now to that young man who was just only following the law, that young man in Kondi Simoy, he was only following the letter of the law. Police harassment. Police harassment. His crime? To follow the determination of the High Court of Zimbabwe. So now it is a crime if you follow what a High Court judge does. We have fallen a long, long way. We have fallen a long, 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 long way. That is why we too are taking those necessary actions to make sure that we as a people can obtain relief. Can obtain relief in its broadest sense. Can breathe. Can live in a proper place. The tribal tensions I spoke about earlier on are real. The tribal tensions have been planted deliberately. They've been brought in very deliberately indeed. My good friends in Chiredzi amongst the Shanghai nation are lost for words at what is happening to them. They cannot understand that really, in a modern day Zimbabwe, with an African government, one that says it fought for their liberation. It is turning around to do this to them, stripping them of their ancestral homes. If they want to plant Lucerne in Chiredzi, they should ask the people of Chiredzi, they should work with the people of Chiredzi. That Lucerne should be planted by the people of Chiredzi. That Lucerne should be harvested by the people of Chiredzi. Those revenues obtained from the sale of that Lucerne should be in the hands of the people of Chiredzi. Harare does not need to come into that. People from afar do not need to come into that. It is the people of Chiredzi, it is their heritage. It is their good fortune that within their arena there is a place where Lucerne can be cropped, can be farmed. Exactly the same principle applies as that principle that was there originally on the Marengi Diamond fields. That the people of that area should have been the ones who controlled that whole enterprise. And yet people in black 4x4 four four twin camps came and took charge. And so I'm making references to these matters to simply show you that we must not allow ourselves to be made tribalists by this government. 
It is this government that is trying to convert us all into tribalists. It is this government that is trying to force feed us hatred. It is this government that is sowing the seeds of tension within our country, on purpose, deliberately. The litmus test which I present to you is in Dabas and Duna Mountain. Let us see what happens there. Let us see. If there is silence and nothing at all happens from the government side, we know they are the ones who have been sowing the seeds of tribalism in the country. They are the ones who have been sowing the seeds of tension. They are the ones who have been sowing the seeds of animosity within the nation. They are the ones who have been sowing the seeds of chaos within the nation. The High Court is the High Court. No one is above that. And yet we are being made to believe that young Floyd Ambrose is above that. And young Floyd Ambrose is getting that protection directly from the President's office. Let us see what the President's office does to Floyd Ambrose. But as we are saying, if nothing is done, we will engage the process of a private criminal prosecution against him and shine the light for the whole world to see what precisely happens within Zimbabwe. The purpose for these tribal tensions and sowing this tension within the country is to deviate our attention from the real issues before us. We read the other day that the COVID vaccine is there, that from that vaccine they have uh, treated nearly 40,000 people. Ladies and gentlemen, 40,000 people in a pool of 10 million. Forty thousand in a pool of ten million. We are not performing. The government is not performing. It hasn't performed throughout this pandemic. It then has the arrogance to produce a vaccine for us in Zimbabwe, coming all the way from China. A vaccine that does not have the necessary paperwork in the international arena to be passed. A vaccine that is coming to Zimbabwe and to use Zimbabweans as guinea pigs. Guinea pigs. A guinea pig is that small thing you test things on to say, does it kill you? Does it not kill you? Does it kill you? Does it not kill you? They accept 200,000 injections of this medicine. And then they clap their hands to say, we have a vaccine. But this vaccine has over 73 side effects. 73. If you have blood pressure, you can't take it. If you have angina, you can't take it. If you have liver complaints, you can't take it. If you have kidney complaints, you can't take it. If you have chest difficulties, you can't take it. And the list continues. Why you cannot take this vaccine that comes from China? My advice would be, do not take the Chinese vaccine. 
the government of Zimbabwe has the money to buy those vaccines which have been approved. The government of Zimbabwe has the money to purchase those vaccines which have been internationally approved. Latest figures from reliable sources say in the last 30 years in Zimbabwe, over 70 billion has gone missing. 70 billion has gone missing. That is why I, as Chief Mbwede, say the government has the money to purchase the vaccines. They choose not to purchase the vaccine. But I'm sure if you looked in their living rooms, you'll find suitcases full of money. If you looked in their kitchens, you'll find suitcases full of money, pots and pans full of money. If you looked in the loft, in the attic, you'll find boxes full of money. This is not science fiction I'm talking about. We saw this precisely in 2017, in the coup that was not a coup. Ministers running left, right and centre, dragging box loads, box loads and suitcases full of money. Millions and millions of US dollars. So the money is there to purchase the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. That money is there. They choose not to use it. That's all. And so these are the matters. These are precisely the matters that the government wants us not to talk about, wants, not, wants us not to discuss about. That is why they create these tribal tensions, by doing these things which they're doing. But in the modern days of Zimbabwe, we have many other problems. Human rights, democracy, rule of law. All these are on the floor. All of these are to date, non-functional. These are things that we should be looking towards the government to say, how do you fix it? Have you fixed it? When will it be completed? Most importantly, we have the electoral reforms that should have been implemented a long time ago. These reforms are the stuff that makes democracy work. Without these reforms, it is a futile endeavour to engage in the electoral process. It is futile. It is useless. Because I can tell you today, today, that without these reforms, the results of the election in 2023 will change nothing in Zimbabwe. That is a certainty. That is a guarantee. And so I'll be appealing to those political parties who are thinking of taking part. Do the honourable thing for a change. Don't take part. Because if you take part, you will not achieve your aims and objectives as a political party. If you take part, you will never form the government of the day. If you take part, the status quo will still remain as it is. If you take part, the people of Zimbabwe will continue to suffer. If you take part, you'll be feeding corruption. If you take part, you'll be feeding lawlessness. If you take part, you'll be nullifying democracy. You'll be nullifying the rule of law. And so I'm appealing to those political parties who are thinking of taking part. Don't. There are other ways. There are other ways. And one of those ways is the Zimbabwean diaspora. Is the Zimbabwean diaspora. 
it constitutes over 50%, 50% of the illegible voters of Zimbabwe. So let us think about it. If you as a political party want to take part in an election where 50% of the voters have been denied the right to vote, why are you taking part? Why are you taking part? Or put another way, you are running a 100 meter race. The person you are racing against is starting 50 meters that way. They are already 50 meters ahead of you. You won't catch them because the race is only 400 meters. They are starting at peg number 50. They are already nearly the finish line. They have nearly arrived at the finish line before you start running. That is why on the 12th of September last year we formed an organization, a campaign called My Right to Vote. It is about putting together, garnering all the support of Zimbabweans all over the world for them to register in My Right to Vote. To come in and register on that. It's an independent organization. It is not a political party. So anyone from anywhere, so long as there's Zimbabweans, can register into it. The importance of my right to vote is that it will facilitate independent elections for the first time for the Zimbabwean diaspora. Independent elections. My right to vote will not be working with ZEC, will not be working with the government of Zimbabwe, but will be working with the entire international arena. My right to vote is the first step on the roadmap for Zimbabwe. This roadmap leads to one destination and one destination only. <clears throat> That destination is an independent transitional government. An independent transitional government. That is the only thing that will enable, <clears throat> that is the only thing that will enable every other political party in Zimbabwe to have a realistic chance a realistic opportunity to affect and to achieve their aims and their objectives. It is the only way. There is no other way. This is the only road available to all those other political parties if you seriously, seriously, seriously wish to govern, wish to achieve your aims and objectives as a political party, you have no option but to subscribe to My Right to Vote. And My Right to Vote is not something new that we've just suddenly thought about. It is an old thing. If you look at the election observers' reports for the last 20 plus years, if you look in the international arena, they have all been speaking about this. <clears throat> they have been talking about this for a long time. So we are going into a place whereby already we have support, we have international support. It's in black and white in so many documents all over the world. So it's nothing new. But even if you're not convinced about that, it was the diaspora at the time which changed Rhodesia into Zimbabwe. It was the diaspora at the time which changed apartheid into the independent South Africa. 
And if we look closer, it was the transitional government of the then Zimbabwe Rhodesian government that transformed Rhodesia into Zimbabwe. It was a transitional government that transformed the apartheid government into the free government that is there in South Africa today. So here we are talking about tried and tested methods that work, that have been shown to work. And so for us as My Right to Vote, we will be canvassing the over 5 million plus Zimbabweans globally to register with us, to take part in our journey, to take part in the roadmap for Zimbabwe, so that we have a realistic, a realistic chance of returning to the rule of law. Let me ask, how comfortable, how safe do all of you feel, wherever you are in the world, especially in Zimbabwe? If someone sent the likes of Floyd Ambrose to you, if they came to your house and bashed down the door, How safe do you feel? If they came to you and harassed you in your own house, how safe do you feel? If they came and removed all of your property in your house, how safe do you feel? If they harassed and intimidated your wife, harassed and intimidated your husband, harassed and intimidated your children. How safe do you feel? And then the icing on the cake. When you report it to the police and the police take no action, how safe do you feel? This is what we're trying to put a stop to. This is what is unacceptable in a Zimbabwe 2021. This is what has no place whatsoever in a Zimbabwe 2021. That is why we put it at the doorstep of the president's office to see what what will our president do? What will our vice president do about the likes of Floyd Ambrose? Will they prosecute? Will they not prosecute? Will they keep silent? Will they ignore it? Actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. I had a conversation with my traditional leaders a few days ago, the village heads in Dawazinduna, of a party in Dawazinduna. We spoke on Zoom. We spoke on Zoom for over three hours plus. The first ever such traditional meeting, long distance traditional meeting on Zoom. It was wonderful. We talked about so many things. The recording will be published so you can have a view of something that is a first in Zimbabwe. The minutes are being typed out. They too will be published so you can read. For the first time you'll be let into the enclave of what a chief speaks to and does when he's talking to his village heads. You'll have an idea of what happens in that closed environment. It will be an educational process for many. 
for many they'll say they did not know such things were spoken about and such things were done and such things were enacted. You will have a bird's eye view of a traditional leadership at work. At work even in the face of adversity, but still at work. So hopefully within a week or so, that will come aboard. I end my conversation with you today by simply saying that young man in Kondisimoni was only following what the High Court judge adjudicated. He was only following what a High Court judge adjudicated. Since when in Zimbabwe has it been a crime for one to follow what a High Court judge says? Since when? I bring this matter directly, directly to the office of the President. We do not want to hear or see that Nkondi Simoyo has been harmed in any way, has been harassed in any way, has been made to feel uncomfortable in any way. He was only following what a High Court judge had adjudicated and what a High Court judge had determined should happen. Thank you very much for your time. Oh.